Welcome to my thoughts on The King of the Dead at the Dog Palace. As always, I read this light novel on Bookwalker, but I'm not sponsored. You'll have to excuse my monotonous but really exaggerated voice. I don't want my roommates knowing I make YouTube videos. Blurb. At any rate, King of the Dead is a story about monsters. It's about fairy tales come to life. Evil necromancer lords experimenting on corpses and raising parades of the dead. And also, the heroic endonites who slay those necromancers with holy powers of light. But mostly, King of the Dead is a story about a sickly kid who died of illness, woke up as a weak undead, and now has to fight those same necromancer lords and heroic endonites to survive. In life, that sickly kid suffered from an incurable disease that left him bedridden and in pain. So, in death, with a body that can now move, he's willing to do whatever it takes to survive and be happy. Even if that means backstabbing people, feasting on corpses, and surviving torture. It's very dramatic, isn't it? This whole novel is dramatic. The action scenes are high stakes from the start. The main character is always a step away from death, and the setting is just people allowing themselves to get caught up in a dog-eat-dog world. King of the Dead is dark, it's gory, and it's the kind of story I feel is better experienced without spoilers. I really want to hold back on plot-relevant details. If the summary I've given so far has caught your interest, I really recommend checking the series out for yourself. So far, The King of the Dead at the Dark Palace has only one novel, but the ending suggests there will be more. Otherwise, well, I'm just gonna talk, and you feel free to stop any time. By the way, I don't ever explain the full plot. I don't really have to, and I don't want to. Instead of the plot, as you can see in the cover, our main character will be joined by another. And it's their relationship, which barely began in this first novel, that I am interested in discussing. Specifically, I want to gush about all the interesting possibilities and complications their relationship might have. Parallel 1. Anomalies Before I can gush about the possible relationships between our main characters, you have to know about them. In particular, you should know about the similarities, but it's better described as parallels. Why these parallels exist, and why they have weight. The main character is named End. This isn't his real name, but he hasn't actually said what it is yet, and I'll describe the other main character later. You need to know Anne's deal first. This novel mostly focuses on Anne's perspective and the foundations of his survival. First, he wakes up, cursed to be an undead by a necromancer lord. According to the setting, there are four different kinds of undead. Specifically, Anne is a fleshman, not a zombie where zombies are rotting corpses and attack the living on instinct, and is an intact, fresh corpse that can be ordered around like a puppet. However, and is an anomaly, and this anomaly makes him monstrous. In fact, the first parallel is that both main characters are anomalies and different from other people. For and in particular, this piece of information is relevant. The vast majority of the undead don't retain memories of their life, they are mindless puppets. However, if those puppets did keep those memories, that intelligence matched with an undead's physical strength would make them a monster. After all, they would be able to trick the living, amass power over time, and then cause massive chaos. Just from that alone, and as a worthy target for the Endonites, who were charged with destroying necromancer lords and their undead servants. The knights don't charge in when things get bad, they like to nip the problem in the bud. So then, if and is going to get hunted anyways, what tools are at his disposal? How can he survive? Well, to start with, he's absolutely defenseless. After all, and hasn't mutated. What do I mean by mutated? Well, all four kinds of undead, given enough time, can mutate. Mutations are thanks to curses, or the magic system that brought the undead back to life in the first place. In this world, there were two kinds of energies. Positive energy, which the living use, and negative energy, which the undead use. 
Negative energy is power and life for the undead. As the undead attain more negative energy, they'll physically mutate in stronger bodies and even gain new abilities. Right now, End is a flesh man. He has no offensive abilities, no regenerative abilities, and he doesn't have a need to eat flesh. He's just like a doll. But the necromancer lord who raised him begins sending him outside to hunt living monsters. This is because negative energy is created when the undead kill living things. The more and kills, the more negative energy he will amass, and eventually he will mutate. The Undernights share a similar magic system. Instead of killing living things, though, they physically train and meditate with a positive energy version of a curse. The knights have blessings. Yeah, there's kind of a religious thing going on with them. I'm not sure if they actually have a god with you divine messages and all that holy stuff. Put another way, were the undead a ferocious, bloodthirsty beast, the Ender Knights are graceful and refined fighters. Now, let me sum up what makes End an anomaly and a target. And is an undead who retains memories of his life. Therefore, he has the intelligence of a human, but the offensive abilities of the undead. To defend himself, and must kill, raise negative energy, and mutate into stronger forms. As an intelligent undead, he's a problem to be mitigated. Now is the time to introduce the other main character, an end knight named Senli. That's right, the woman you see on this cover is an end knight, and God given enemy. Her character is that of a cold face, but a warm heart. She is an anomaly within the Ender Knights for two reasons. First, her blessing is abnormally large, and regenerates itself almost instantly. If you play games or read a lot of isekai, then you are probably aware of how MP, or magic power, works. For people who can use magic, MP is often represented by numbers, let's say a max of 10. The spells one can cast costs a certain number of MP. Let's say fireball costs 2 MP. So a caster can cast 5 fireballs before hitting 0 MP. Once a caster's MP is drained, they have to wait a while for the magic power to regenerate. And let's say that same caster wants to use mega fireball, which costs 5 MP. So they can only cast it twice within a 10 MP pool. So anyone who uses magic finds it hard to use spells with high MP cost because it takes a day or maybe days for that MP to come back. Lots of settings even make it time to use all that MP. This kind of setting is no different for the usual Ender Knights. They have a limited amount of blessings to use and can't fight anymore once that amount is used up. They can do a super duper blast maybe three times. They will also physically exhaust. Now, take Senli. In a fight with a Necromancer Lord, she takes that super duper blast and turns it up ten times. She doesn't even deplete her blessing with this one move. And because the blessing regenerates quickly, she can just keep tossing out this 10 times super duper move for hours and hours. Necromancers in the setting can split their lives, just like Voldemort created seven new lives using Horcruxes. But this Necromancer Lord created 120 lives. So she just uses that high MP move 120 times. Crazy. As for the second reason why San Li is an anomaly, the Ender Knight's duty requires them to be cruel. Senli isn't really an Ender Knight in philosophy, and describes her as being an ally of the weak. This is why. Necromancers are still human. They had to live under a roof, eat food, and wear clothes. Since they like to experiment in all kinds of corpses, human and monster, they have to find those corpses somehow. So whether they willfully joined or were kidnapped, Necromancers have human servants and make deals with human merchants, and those human servants and merchants are enemies of the Ender Knights, as well as casualties. The Ender Knights fight darkness first, to protect people second. But for San Li, who joined the Ender Knights to protect people, her philosophy is often at odds with her teacher and her companions. In the storyline, they petition her to destroy a forest in order to find a necromancer lord hiding inside. She refuses and tries to find another method, because destroying the forest would send the monsters inside rampaging through the nearby town. Her companions make suddenly accept a time limit of a week, though, with this reason. Sacrifice a little in the short term, and more people will survive in the long term. It's a deaf world they live in. Of course, the other knights believe Sun Lee is a weak at heart and naive. Not totally wrong. 
to sum up the first parallel, both end and suddenly are anomalies and monsters. And as an intelligent undead, with the potential to become a massive threat, suddenly is an overpowered endonite, but weak-hearted and an ally of the weak. Parallel 2. The Past and Attitudes both End and Senli share a similar past, which then motivated their instroy attitudes. This past is that of sickness. My dramatic blurb of this novel covered End's past. In life, he was a sickly kid. His entire body withered away, and he was stuck in bed for the few years before his death. He couldn't get out of bed because he was in so much pain. The kid fought for every second of his life with all his mental power. And got sick when he was ten, and probably died when he was 13 or 14, so he never got to live a full life. This is why N shows such mental fortitude in the novel. I said before that he's willing to backstab people and cut ties to save himself, to feast on corpses and ignore the human taboo, and also to survive torture. Torture, which was to experience the very same debilitating pain he experienced in his first life, unable to move and just willing himself to live for seconds and more seconds through willpower alone. And yes, the image I am showing on screen is real. He was just ahead, getting tortured by the sun, because the undead are like that and are weak to the sun. The, the sun is just positive energy. San Li was stuck in bed because her blessing was too strong for her body. It's certainly not as dramatic as En's own sickness and eventual demise, but she describes being stuck in bed for months and being grateful to the people who tended to her during that time. That's why, when her current teacher approached her and offered to teach her how to control her blessing, she later joined the Endonites so that she can help people the same way she was helped during her sickness. Their actual philosophies are quite different. At all costs, and wants to survive. Now that he's able to enjoy having a future and a body that isn't in pain all the time, he wants to live the happy life that he couldn't before. At all costs, Sunli wants to protect the weak. To do that, she'll risk her own life and even be willing to sacrifice it. If she had to, she absolutely would grit her teeth and destroy that forest. She wouldn't just do nothing. So, it's their attitudes that are similar. At all costs, the ends justify the means. You down, and in Sunli are pretty similar people. At least, I feel like it. Strong-willed, goal-oriented, and intelligent individuals who can understand each other and make a compromise at the end of the first novel. Because, somehow, they actually make a deal for the journey together. This is the circumstances of their deal. And is an intelligent undead who wants to live. He won't hurt people if he doesn't have to. San Li is an ally of the weak who understands and is intelligent and hasn't given into his undead instincts, which is to eat the living, by the way. So this is a two strangers deal. San Li is a watch guard. If and ever makes a move that would hurt a human or prove he's losing to his undead instinct, then she kills him. San Li is also his food. By the end of the novel, and has mutated into a lesser vampire. He needs blood to survive. And she offers hers. Bonus points for her being an endonite because he can absorb more power that way. I really, absolutely did not know that they would travel together. The surprise brings with it so many interesting possibilities. The relationships that they could have and the different ways they can view each other from now on. I wasn't kidding that they barely have a relationship. Suddenly herself doesn't appear that much until close to the end of the novel. In that short time, like literally a few days, there was an almost mutual respect. And sees San Li as being the purest person he knows. Not in terms of innocence, like a, a little kid, but as someone who has deep compassion and kindness for others, along with a strong determination to help those people. He doesn't say it directly, but he seems to admire her. And San Li, of course, sees End as a human, not a member of the undead. She regards him with human decency, and also describes End as being timid but intense, in a short POV at the end of the novel. They could have a great relationship, or it could all go downhill. Let's try and describe these possible relationships in turns with... Labels. 
Because there aren't many interactions between them yet, and Sen Li has barely begun her carriage with Zayson, it's complicated to describe what kind of relationship they could have, and every label you try to append just makes the possibilities so interesting. So, how about we start with rivals? While reading, my first thought of End and Sen Li as rivals, this was back before I found out they were going to journey together. I had thought of them as being rivals of mutual respect, but also fierce competition. Like a game of cat and mouse, like thief and detective. Eventually, one would catch the other. Or maybe they might mutually stop the chase and go their separate ways. Or even join forces. Though in a gory series like this, I figure the story will lead to one of their deaths. Still might. To be specific, and has said repeatedly that he wanted to leave the forest. If he wants to live happily, then he wants to go see the sights, join events, and do tons of fun stuff. B being a forest shut in wouldn't help his case, so I figured he'd be on the run. The other knights wouldn't know of his existence at first, so were teased with Sam Lee's appearance. Only later would they meet, get to know each other, and then become rivals when she finds out Anne's true identity. In my mind, the setup was a letter that and anonymously wrote to Sen Li. Instead of having to destroy the forest to find the necromancer lord, the letter and wrote is a map leading to the lord's mansion. Sen Li would have no idea who sent the letter, but would be very grateful. And, of course, would take the time to dash very far away as soon as he confirms his necromancer lord dies. Then events would transpire such that the two would meet again. When Sen Li comes close to finding out Anne's true identity, he would reveal that <laughs> he's a good man that sent the letter, and he had revealed his identity at the time because he was scared of the necromancer lord. He had actually escaped during the fight. <laughs> really, he should be thanking her for saving his life. All this to try and sway Sen Li's sense of compassion and goodwill. Sen Li would be tricked, indeed. But then, something would happen, of course, and Anne's identity would be revealed anyways. And the very same thing that does happen in the novel would happen here. Sen Li sees all the evidence of Anne being very human, very rational, and very kind. In my mind, Sen Li would still stick to her guns as an Andonite, but falter. The characterization I expected from her was a gradual wavering. That's not true in the novel. And it's why I think their relationship could be exciting, because she doesn't waver at all on whether End is worth protecting. She straight up quits the other knights to watch over, protect, and feed him, all out of compassion. As for the next and last label, I thought of them as love interest. I mean, come on, I know how the world works. Oh, that and if they do become just friends, most, if not all, of what I describe here will still apply. And of course, this love interest line of thought follows the rival section for a reason. As in, don't they have a kind of Mr. and Mrs. Smith kind of vibe? That was a movie starring two spies on opposing sides who lived together as husband and wife. They got to know each other, fall in love, struggled to kill each other, and also wrestled with their own feelings. I don't remember how the movie ends, but it was probably a happy ending. I except for the happy ending bit, I feel like And and Sun Lee would have a similar relationship. Start off with an uneasy but mutual respect. Both And and Sun Lee don't think terribly of the other, but they're tense. They're journeying with someone that can easily kill them if they're ever off guard. But they get to know each other, see the sights, join festivals and events, Maybe buy items for each other at a busy marketplace, play heroes to people in danger, and of course, save each other's lives. A little hand-holdy, little huggy, a little looking into each other's eyes romantically. They will get to know each other as more than intelligent undead and compassionate ex endonite Rather than strangers, they would become partners. Partners still playing the same cat-and-mouse game all the while, always on guard, and always wanting to save his own ass and plotting meticulously against Sen Li. Sen Li, always keeping an eye out for people in danger 
and keeping another eye on end. One is always ready to kill the other. Unless? How would the philosophies change during all that time spent journeying together? Would End find himself in love with Senli, unable to live a happy life without her? Would he be unable to kill her anymore? Maybe even accept the death by her hand? And what about Senli? What if she fell in love with him, but then he goes berserk one day? Would Senli be able to kill End, or would she try to contain him and hope that he'll come back to himself one day? And what if they do fall in love, but ultimately pick their own philosophy over that love, betraying one another? and maybe living to regret it. Doesn't it just make you wonder? Will End or Sunli someday abandon the philosophies? Will they change so much to become totally different people? How well will the author build up their relationship? What ending will they pick? Will the strangers grow to love each other or hate each other? For now, I've settled on this kind of label for the current relationship. Tentative partners. There was so much potential. If it wasn't obvious, I like watching certain kinds of rivals slash enemies to lovers. In any case, I do have a last topic to talk about. Good people, bad people, and if morality can be applied. Morality can always be applied. Morality is absolutely going to be a major part of And and Sunley's characters. Well, more like their moral systems or what they think is right and wrong. And himself is fully aware that his existence is abnormal, feared, and hated. All his actions to protect himself are sheer blasphemy. But he doesn't care. He has common sense. He knows what's right and wrong. As a hero, Sunli has to abide by some kind of common sense as well. But I am curious as to what rules she abides by. The author seems to like creating more dilemmas, so I want to see how she'll handle the more dilemmas she'll come across. A few of those dilemmas will probably be ends making too. In any case, what I mean by good people and bad people is the idea of a hero, a good person who helps people and fights evil, and I want to focus on that, a good person. In that sense, nobody in this novel is a good person. Obviously, the necromancer lord isn't a good person. He abuses his servants, absolutely experiments on humans, and definitely engineered many people's deaths. But also not his human servant, a slave called Lu, who is happy to sell out End for mildly better treatment. Honestly, she doesn't even get to be a person in life. In death, anybody who read this novel and actually thought Lu was gonna survive? It was sweet so much in the audience. I finally get to use that line on somebody else. Though I do like what the author did with her in death. But not even the Endonites are good people, because... They don't care about casualties, but hypocritically, they do care about their own teammates. And as you can guess, and also isn't a good person for being ready at a moment's notice to kill, maim, and feast. Suddenly as well, though I can't offer any evidence at this point in time, she emanates that kind of aura. It makes me curious to see what she might do. But that doesn't make them bad people either. Either or situations are appealing because they're simple choices. Therein lays a trap. Believe me, I've fallen for it so many times. The very concept of good people and bad people doesn't really apply here. I can't apply a weak moral system like that to their actions. What I'm saying is that this is a really subjective novel, morally speaking. What does good and bad mean to you? Down to the very specific actions, circumstances, and maybe even thoughts. Do you agree with the idiom, the ends justify the means? An idiom that encapsulates the whole novel? And wants to survive. He's willing to do anything. Suddenly wants to protect people. She's willing to defy her companions and hand herself to a monster because she believes he's human on the inside. The Endonites want to defeat the necromancers. They're willing to kill the people they protect if it means victory. In that sense, only you, the reader, can decide. Do you understand why they do what they do? Do you sympathize? Even empathize? Do you admire them? Or do you really fucking hate them? To me, well, I mean they're just fictional characters. I'm fond of them. I hope the author pencils a compelling psychological game between End and Sen Li. 
and that they remain strong-willed characters. The Elder Knight's philosophy is interesting to see in action, and it feels like Sun Lee will play interference. Of course, there's probably a whole side cast of slimy but motivated characters out there to see. But, personally, I don't like, and probably never will like, any of them. I guess that makes me a fan of gossip about them. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Most of what I said here is, this is what I hope for from the series. I hope it's a gory, dark romance thriller. I have proposed nothing new under the sun. But then, that's why execution is such a difficult task. Because even if I or the author had proposed a new, insane idea, it's all up to how we execute it. So, in that sense, as someone who isn't doing a plot point by plot point review like usual, I wonder if I executed the thoughts part of the title well. I don't actually like this series, but I do like where it might go. So while King of the Dead isn't high on my list, I will be checking the next novel sometime after it comes out. That's my video on The King of the Dead at the Dark Palace. Bye.